Hello Tasters and welcome to Who's He Talking To? And today I'm talking to Liverpool's entertaining icon, Mr Mick the Cat. How are you Mick? I'm alright Jeff, yourself? Thanks very much for coming along today. My pleasure, my pleasure. Brilliant stuff. So Mick, why did he call you Mick the Cat? Because I told him to. <laughs> <laughs> no, Mick the Cat. Cat is a, it's, it's a catalyst. That's what our job is. People think it's a meow cat, it's not. Uh, our job, we do the same thing. We turn up, up at a place and people sit there and it's like, okay, entertain me. So that's what I do, hopefully. Uh, so I have to turn up somewhere and make some kind of impact. That's what catalysts do. So let's make a catalyst. Brilliant. I never knew that. But I can't spell that. <laughs> <laughs> so no previews. I'll make the cat. <laughs> make the cat it is. Yeah, yeah. So Mick, where did you grow up and tell us some tales about where you were, where you come from and your yeah, family? Yeah. Uh, Pinehurst Avenue in Anfield, number 116. Interesting really because you know what that is, don't you? Tell me about it, Mick. 9-11 upside down. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a quarter to that. 116 So 116 in Piney Yard, yeah, with uh, my nine brothers and sisters. Nine. Uh, five boys, five girls. My father, Charlie, my mother, Annie. And uh, I believe, I can't remember, when uh, my granddad was sick, uh, he came to live in the house as well. So that was a three-bedroom. Oh, no, three we were posh, us, we had it. A three bedroom uh, semi on uh, Pioneer Avenue, big front and back garden, which was fantastic, you know. Uh, but my garden was Pioneer Avenue, uh, it was out as early as possible, and you only went in for your dinner and when you could hear your mother shouting, yeah. That was it. What did your dad do? With? What was his occupation? Uh, well, my dad was a baker. Um, before the war, he was a baker at Black Ledges, and then he volunteered in 1940, and he joined the Royal Navy, and he served from 1940 to 1946, uh, basically full on, no, not coming home, you know, he came home occasionally when the ship was uh, stationed in Liverpool, because that was its home base, uh, HMS Fish, Fish Guard, U-59, if you look through its service history, it's, it just opens your eyes where they went. They were in Russia, they were in Canada, they did the North Atlantic convoys, he went to East Africa, he was on Operation Torch, which I'm sure you know what that is. So he was in a figure, is that when the, uh, the submarines as well, not the, 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 the U-boats, the Germans in the North Atlantic? That's where he was, yeah. Operation Torch was the uh, invasion of North Africa. Okay. He delivered uh, British troops there. He was in Kenya. He was in um, Australia, New Zealand. I spoke to him one day, and it was uh, where were you on VE day, Dad? And he was on um, on operations in the South China Sea. And, uh, so it wasn't it was a bit toys for him. Everyone no, was, no, he was celebrating. He was uh, getting ready for the um, the so-called invasion of Japan, which, as we know, was a hoax. All ready to drop the atom bomb. Yeah, another subject you're going to touch on as well. Hopefully. <laughs> so your dad's seen a lot of destruction and, um, as I said, the, the war, the, the second world really war. He didn't really talk about it much. He always spoke about the good times. Um, he spoke about when he was in Portsmouth and there was an air raid and he was in a band, my dad. And uh, he was drumming on stage and there was an air raid going on. And he <laughs> said, what are we going to do? And they, they all decided to stay. So they just kept on playing. Yeah. That's the one, yeah. Uh, you know, that's, that's amazing. That's like the Titanic, you know, you see the film and the, <laughs> the, 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 it goes down. Does it go, keep playing? Oh, yeah, well, what else are they going to do? So you tell us the thought, if it happens, it happens, you know, brave fellows. I'm going to say something, the drumming. So that's when you mention this. Obviously, you're, you're a renowned percussionist, a drummer. Um, is that what inspired you to become music, or did you have that musical sort of what do you call it? The, the I, I grew up in a family where, where my dad um, 
he, he became an entertainer. He was a your classic uh, resident drummer. Uh, he was the resident drummer in St. Charles in Cali Farm. He was uh, St. Michael's, I think it was, in Egbert. And he was in All Saints in Anfield. Uh, what's the other one I'm missing out? I'm missing out loads, but he, he worked out. Because the thing about my dad, he wasn't a brilliant drummer, but he was a great entertainer. Uh, he used to play his drums, you know, like this. <laughs> oh, oh, so I think that's where I've got my okay style from. <laughs> the style. Because again, you say a percussionist and that, I'm probably therefore not the best drummer in my family. So <laughs> that, 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 that's funny because I first met Mick. Well, I, I first heard Mick when he was playing in the Irish House. Um, I what I was in Smoky Mo's and I just looked out and I seen yourself singing on a bus going past <laughs> with a mic and you were hanging off the bus with tap shoes <laughs> and you know and little did I know he, he was still performing he was actually performing in the Irish house but that was just part of his gig where a bus would come past he'd come outside jump on a bus whilst the people are all in there because he had the radio control mic it must have been a good mic by the end one of the best of course and he's entertained, he's entertained, got off the next stop, singing along, and he's walking past again. And then the, a massive cheer arose because he kept that. How the hell did you, you know, was the one the music got outside? You just it knew. doesn't matter if you're in time or not because everyone's singing the song anyway. You're in sync. Yeah. <laughs> that's <'Cause>, amazing. <laughs> and again, that's just part of it's that catalyst thing. I realised when you do that thing, when you're on stage, people are watching every single moment of everything. So everything you it's like, oh what's that? We're more observant than we think we are, you know, subconsciously. So things are going on. And it's up to us when we're on stage to to take advantage of that. So yet when I was drumming with bands, <laughs> the actors drumming with me, because the singer had turned up and signed set up at the front of the stage and I'd set my drums up right at the front of the yeah, stage. I'm the show man here. <laughs> right, and I used to stand up playing the drums. And I was I wasn't quiet, that's all I'll say. I, was, I used to think that, you know, part of it was the volume. I'll never forget a gig. I was with a, a great gang, a gang of lads, uh, animated classics back in the 80s. And uh, we used to open up with, like, Sleepwalk by um, Ultravox, you know, big power song. Yeah. Uh, and then we do another hard rocking song. But then the third song was always uh, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Is that, is that off the, uh, the Wizard of Oz? That's the one. The Wizard of Oz. Yeah. Yeah. But Paul used to, uh, Paul the lead singer was very dramatic. And uh, he'd be playing the piano, big piano intro on the song. Yeah. Uh, and he'd be singing the song on his own. Well, I used, all I used to do was play a tambourine in the first bit. Somewhere over the rainbow. But I used to, I jumped off the drums and like this. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere. And I, I was watch, just watching all this going by playing this. And Paul is singing the song, playing the piano in darkness. And all the front lights are on me. <laughs> it's a socket set. So, yeah, they, it just wants to liven things up. I didn't it? want to do anything. It's just a case of that's, what, you, that's just what, you change. Change. what you do. That's what you do. It's just it's a small change. It's combustion. I didn't not. expect that then. So it's not pre-planned. Absolutely amazing. You know. <laughs> do you know what, Mick? That's just. I mean, there's more. So your school. Did you? You know. Was you? Was you like that in school, or was you a good boy? Oh, like, no, no. Did you ever get the uh, cane? No. Listen, I went to bed up until I was probably fifteen. Okay. And so, as I've said before, nine brothers and sisters. So every day. I went into school, I stunk. So you can watch that. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, I, you know, you used to go down in hand me downs. I never had, you know, I, I remember going to school in my sister's shoes. Yeah. Uh, with a pair of my brother's um, rugby shorts on, were massive on me. <laughs> and no undies. So uh, that's why I can fight. So, so you know, that, another thing with Mix, because uh, you might. Never ever judge a book by the cover because Mick uh, he got into martial arts, but you're naturally strong anyway, you, you know. And what I've seen is like the crack of the whip and stuff like that. And uh, it's just, it always it always appears to me that Tony Silvano, the big doorman, because when I first see him, I said, Who's Danny? That's Mick the Cat. I said, it's, You know, he's dressed, it's just, 
you neatly dressed and did you get the piss taken out of them? Oh no, <laughs> this is Tony Giovanni, you know. No, he said a lot of people have, have, have made made the wrong choice by looking at Mick thinking that he's just obviously someone who's bizarre and clusters, you know, and, and he's going to get picked on. So straight away, you know, Mick, Tony Giovanni said, you, you know, you've, you've tossed many people, tossed the caber. You, you sort of don't want to hit them, but... No, no, you've got to make it look as though you're not doing anything. And you just, just put them in some kind of compromising position. Yeah. I, I'll never forget, I was doing it at Chucky's Wine Bar in uh, Rice Lane on roller skates. It's <laughs> right, it's going to get on roller skates. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's because again, it's that yeah. I love roller skates and uh, it looks good. I, I used to love uh, one of my heroes is Gene Kelly, absolutely genius. Yeah, um, and it's all about the expression of the body, you know. So, um, but he did it on roller skates, so I thought, well, why not? And it went down because you know what, it makes people laugh. Do you know what, Mick? It's just it's, it's splendid speaking to me because I'm just trying to. Pick your brains. No, let me tell you about what, what, what happened in Chucky was somebody tried to uh, grab the mic off me. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as they say, one of the lads, you know, tried to grab the mic off me. And uh, before you know it, he's getting like really, I'm, I'm dodging it. And, uh, and he, he really conformed, so I thought, okay, no messing with this. So, uh, I ended up with him uh, against, they used to have pillars in there. Um, Chucky's. I was singing with me left and with me right hand. I had him in an arm lock against the uh, <laughs> against the pillar, singing till his mates all came over and said, "Oh, he's only messing, mate." Yeah. yeah, he was until you let him walk all over you, and then that's what happens. I mean, you got these catchphrases: um, "Shake it like you've got a strap on." on. <laughs> <laughs> Straight away, you know the audience is singing somewhere over the rainbow, and then in between you come out with some sayings, and then yeah, you've got to. What's the uh, oxymoron? Shout that you can, What is an oxymoron? An oxymoron is uh, something that actually doesn't make sense. Uh, well, miming the dancing is an oxymoron. Miming the dancing. Miming the dancing. Yeah. So you can't you can't mime a dance. Exactly. So it's an oxymoron. Another, oxymoron. Another oxymoron is. Uh, Pass me uh, plastic glasses, will you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any more oxymorons? Comment down below. Well, they say uh, US military intelligence is another oxymoron. <laughs> oh, I like that. <laughs> US. But I do like oxymorons. And the thing about that oxymoron, mime and the dancing, it rhymes. Uh, so what I say is, who's an oxymoron? Or, who's an oxymoron? Who's an oxymoron? Do you know who I am? And that's the way I communicate <laughs> with the audience because I hate the, the people who try to be Michael McIntyre, you know, yeah. you know, try to pretend like they love everyone, like yeah. they care about you when they don't. <laughs> so <laughs> you've just got to. No, you, I, what you've got to do, I think, is just find a little bit of a, a personality and you go with it. And that works for me. And it, it does, it gets a laugh. You know, when you're in somewhere and you're, you know, singing a song um, and I don't know what people expect of you, but they don't get what they expect from me, really. They just get what I give them. Mick, it's, it's just, it, it comes off the sandwiches. He used to come on and say, he used to take over me, he was in Smoky Moe's and then Maureen Brown will give us the stage um, at the time, Central Liverpool. And I was pleasant, we used to have a Monday. I'd go on to do the karaoke and then the artist Mick will come on after me. And people go, who's on? I say, Mick the cats, what's he like? Well, stay and watch the show. And used to bring the crowd, obviously, from because you had a following. Um, and people say to me, the crowd used to say, you just don't know what to expect from Mick, you don't know what's coming on. You know, you get some bands, um, and you know, they go through the rigmarole of, of the gig, and people like that, you know, the songs, the Motown and such. And, but make the cast, there was always something that you throw in. No, well, that's, that's what I mean. I like doing stuff like the bare necessities or, you know. Yeah. Um, I love Al Jolson. Um, if anyone dies, I tend to do, uh, you know, a tribute to them. So, you know. Do you know what? It's fantastic. So from, 
from like the like the bare necessities, and then the next one is a Lady Gaga or David Bowie or whoever. I don't really care. Music for me appeals to me. It doesn't matter what type of music it is. It's it's the performance, and of course, if you're using half the battle is using a good PA. Um, now where we were, Smokies. Yeah. You, know, you, you can't you can't help but if you can't turn up and use their PA and sound good you you might as well get out the game. So um, and for me when I was working around the pubs, I'd turn up with a five and a half K ad lib audio PA. Uh, or EQ'd by Dave Fletch. Uh, he's the man who did David Bowie's uh, PA, so yeah, I mean, good heavens. I should, I mean, a, a lot of the, the like the icicle works and there's a, you know the Liverpool famous people who made like got signed and stuff. You, you played amongst them as well, haven't you? No, I didn't work for the icicle works. I, I was in a band called Deja Vu in the eighties, who was sort of associated with a lot of stuff. But we were a covers band. That's that's what we were. But well, everyone used to come and watch us. We were a town band back in the eighties, you know. Um, and I didn't think again we were as musical as a lot of the other bands, whether it be School for Girls, Cook the Books, Thunder Boots, you know, Rage, not in, well, Rage, they weren't really on. They were in our clique, yeah. but they were the, they were the gods. Yeah. They were the gods. John Mylett. So we were never, and I've never wanted anyone to think, we think we're in their league, we're not. But uh, when people saw our band, they were just as entertaining because we had personalities on the stage and we delivered that personality and people could feel it. Harry, our frontman, I don't know, he won't mind me saying this, and if he does, so what? Um, <laughs> he was never going to be a great singer, but he was an absolutely fantastic frontman. So you know what makes up, what inspired, what, what, what musical influences? Because uh... Of course, the Beatles, I was nine and listening to the White Album over and over again. I used to listen to uh, number nine. You know that one? Number nine. Number nine. That's, that's the song. Number nine. Number nine. Now, what I'll do when I'm, I'll just put a drink. Sometimes I'll put a yeah. dance track on I've never heard before. Uh, and mime over it. Number nine. Number nine. <laughs> <laughs> I have number nine. So, yeah. Um, Didn't they Paul Arcastle get the number 19? That was a similar. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. But so that's what I mean. It's it's about the performance. So Beatles were obviously were just uh, massive in our house. But I grew up um, in our house all the time. It'd be the whole Liverpool Express because my brother used to play for them. Yeah. So they'd be in our house. Um, Rage, what we, they were called nuts at the time. They were in our house. So I was influenced by them kind of musicians. People like Andy Wilson, Dave Graham. Uh, you know, uh, but I'm not really yeah. sure. Who was singing out of that export? Export. Sure. I can sing him now with his, yeah. his shirt open and he used to push the mic away and catch it with his foot. Again, fan Harry Shaw. Harry Shaw. So from, like, did you know from school, uh, in school, did you, get, did you just go straight into music? Is that, was, was that I was in a band in school, yeah, played the school disco. Uh, and in fact, a lad who was our singer, a fellow called John Riley, he became very successful um, in a yeah. band called The Boy on a Dolphin. And he's based in Sheffield now, uh, doing very, very well. Do you keep in touch? Does he, or does he, he yeah. speak on Facebook and that, you know, but not, uh, you know, he's a uh, Sheffield now. Okay. All the time, so. so from school, you went to a band. Did you have any other careers or did, was you just just musically minded or? Uh, I worked at Tate and Lyle for four years, that was great. Um, when I say worked. <laughs> <laughs> what, Tate and Lyle? Tate and Lyle. You don't know what Tate and Lyle No, was? I was just thinking. Uh, that was a sugar refinery. But it has to be said, yeah. the only men who worked in Tate and Lyle were the women. Right. <laughs> Most men used to turn up, clock on, go and get changed into our overalls. Yeah. And then maybe we go and have a look at the job and it was all right, go and have a bevy in the dog's vault or the green man or the non parano Did you get paid to have a bevy? Oh, it was, it was the job. It was, um, the, the culture was drinking. I, I, yeah. I was an alcoholic from uh, probably 17 to about 21. And that was me taking my years. And it was, 
It was, it was a fun afternoon. Yeah. So you, you get on with it. Well, me, my dad worked on the Stokes, on the, you know, on the, on, on the, uh, the, the Maisie. And I, he'd take me as a kid and I'd all be drinking whiskey. And then I, I'd go for the dinner, we'd have a liquid lunch. That's what right. So, so we, anyway, the, stand by. It was vital if anyone said, yeah. everyone said, anyone fancy a swift half? <laughs> and a swift half could last. That's right. I'm anyway, really, it's not about swift halves. Stand by for the next half of me and Mick the Cat. Take care. <laughs> right, where's that fucking...